Aloha aina kako e kuulahui e nga hoa velo like. Aloha aina kalo kanuoka aina a me nga ano ano i luia i ka hiki. Nga hua ea o kea Hawaii aloha aina kako. O au o noe lani gudia ka opua. I'm noe, this is first Friday. And we're joining you here for the July episode. Um, July is the month of kala hoi hoi ea which is the topic of what we're talking about today, but it was also awesome to see the images in the video you just watched of um, In Flagrante Delicto, Big Island Conspiracy, Uncle Kipioane, and all the images of the Kia'i on Mauna Kea, because July is also the uh, one-year anniversary of the most recent uh, beginning uprisings of, um, and the arrest of Kupuna on the Alahulu Kupuna on Mauna Kea. So, I'm really uh, excited to bring in a couple of guests today who are going to talk with us about Kala Hoi Hoi Ea. Um, both were Kia'i on the Mauna uh, over this past year, and both are also going to be addressing the issue of why Black Lives Matter in the Hawaiian Kingdom, because what we're also experiencing here um, in this last couple of uh, months is the the global uprising of peoples standing for Black lives and against anti-racism or against racism. So um, I'm really excited to have uh, Joy Enamoto and Imai Kalani Winchester. Joy Lehuanani Enamoto is a Kanaka Maoli and Aloha Aina artist and activist, an educator who holds master's degrees in library and information sciences, as well as in Pacific Island studies. Joy's artwork and scholarship have been in and on the covers of numerous publications. She works on issues of climate justice, mountain protection, demilitarization, and many, many other issues affecting the peoples of Oceania. Imai Kalani Winchester is a Kanaka Aloha Aina who was raised in Waipio O'ahu. For the past 17 years, he has worked as a kumu at Halau Kumana Public Charter School, where he is also the kahu of Aihuala Malo'i. He too is an artist, uh, a carver, and today he is going to be speaking in his role as the lead organizer of Kala Hoi Hoi Ea Honolulu. Um, for those of you who don't know, La Hoi Hoi Ea is the first uh, national holiday of the Hawaiian Kingdom and has been celebrated since the 1980s. So um, welcome, Imai and Joy. Aloha kako. Aloha. Do you think you guys could um, share a little bit about yourselves before we we get into it today? Tell us a little bit about, about a little more about who you are and maybe um, some of the kumu that you'd like to bring into the space of this conversation today. What do you want to go first? Why don't you go, Joy? Okay. Aloha mai kako, Joy lehu nani inamoto. As uh, Noi already said, I am an artist and an educator. Uh, I am both Kanaka uh, and uh, African American descent. I'm also Japanese and East Asian and Scottish descent. Um, I think I'm forget. Oh, and Cato descent. Um, and I have really came back to. I grew up in California, and I came back to Hawaii literally because of Hanani K. Trask. Uh, I met her at a conference uh, and she looked at me and said, what are you doing here? And that pretty much put a seed in my mind, a hua in my mind. And so I knew from that moment um, that I needed to come home and, and do some, some work over here. But before Honani K, um, I mean, there's just so many, uh, but I'd have to say June Jordan, Veve Clark, Barbara Christian, uh, Angela Davis have all been amazing women in my life that uh, gave me clarity about how to organize, how to use your voice in resistance, uh, and the meaning of intersectionality uh, in our in our and internationalism in our resistance movement. So uh, that's a little bit about me. Ano ai kelo kako e na hoa velo like, um, mai ko piko awa kea ka 
Ekai Hohonua Kanaloa. My name is Imai Kalani Winchester. Um, mahalo for the introduction. I'm from Waipio. Um, Oahu, I'm Kanaka Maoli. Um, I'm kind of a Hawaiian mixed plate, uh, Chinese, and a dash of Haole at the end. Um, I am a teacher uh, in the Hawaiian Charter School movement for several years. Um, I am a student again at the University of Hawaii um, in the Department of Education, also trying to um, work for my PhD um, so that I can sort of uh, uh, progress to the next level. Um, and today, a lot of the teachers that I think about today who kind of put me in the position where I am um, first starts with my parents. Um, they're very influential. I think a lot of us, you know, um, we'll say that as well. Um, I also have a very uh, similar experience uh, with the fiery Dr. Trask, um, somebody who uh, really stood out in my life as a teacher because um, I have never been more directly challenged um, in my being um, as a Kanaka, as a man, um, as a son, you know, uh, as a teacher um, now today to really uh, be considered of the things that I'm working towards um, and her sharpness and her articulation of our situation really helped to clarify for me a lot of the deep-seated frustration and angst that I felt uh, but could not really um, communicate. Um, likewise, uh, professors Kanalu Young, uh, Dr. John Osorio um, provided a very strong balance uh, for me in my life um, at the university. I also think of important people like uh, Papa Soli Nihil, um, Ati Terry Kiko Olani, um, and a lot of my contemporaries, but uh, I owe, I guess, the most to, to an individual um, who would be sort of one of the four, uh, the fathers you know, of the Hawaiian modern movement, um, Kikuni Blaisdell, um, for which um, Kalaho Ihoiea was first introduced to me um, as a national pastime, sort of erased, suppressed um, in the month of, you know, we're just getting off of uh, July, uh, June 19th um, and the massive celebration of liberation and freedom um, across of America. And likewise, I think Kalaho Ihoiea um, aspires um, to build and generate that's it, that type of catalyst for our people as well, too, um, in terms of education, in terms of celebration, um, and the path towards freedom and liberation. Um, I'll leave it at that. Mahalo for those introductions and bringing those um, esteemed kumu to the table. And I know many of the viewers of First Friday will appreciate that both of you talked about Kumu Haunani Pia Trask, who is one of the founders of this show. Um, so I am hoping that um, viewers may also know that you're both amazing orators. And one of the things for me that is super cool about having you both on is that you're two of my heroes. And it's awesome when your heroes are the people that you love and who are friends and who are close to you. Um, and so many people may know about how great you are as orator, political orators. Um, but some may not. And so I'm going to share a little bit of uh, video of, of each of you speaking at uh, different points throughout. And so I thought maybe I would just start with um, this short video of Imai. It's from one of the Laho Ihoi'ea events in 2017. And then I'll ask you to talk a little bit about it. So let's see. Sorry, guys. There we go. This is Ahamele Air 2017.
Okay, oh, the Hawaiian Kingdom lives. Imai, could you tell us a little bit about you're asking people to, you know, remember this day and tell the story of this day. Can you tell us a little bit about the story of this day? Sorry, you're muted. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me start again. Kalaho Iho Ea um, is an extremely important um, holiday for us, Kanaka Maoli, uh, for us Hawaiian subjects, uh, for us people who call Hawaii our home. Um, it recognizes um, and celebrates the fundamental principles of justice um, and freedom and independence. Um, back in the time of the Kamehamehas, um, specifically 1843, um, the ruler, Kamehameha Ekolu Kawi Keoli, uh, son of the big guy, uh, was experiencing a lot of like imperial turmoil um, in the young kingdom. Um, and so during his, um, during his efforts to secure uh, international sovereignty, which many of us already kind of know about, um, there was likewise at the very same time um, a small insurrection in Hawaii where a man by the name of Lord George Paulette um, acting on behalf of an emissary um, named Richard Charlton uh, from the King uh, from the United Kingdom, and temporarily um, seized uh, authority from Kawi Keoli uh, through gunboat diplomacy. And for five months, uh, the story kind of goes: how flags were collected from around the Hawaiian Kingdom, uh, they were burned, um, Union Jacks um, were put in their place. Um, after this five-month uh, sort of occupation, uh, Queen Victoria dispatches uh, Admiral Richard Thomas. Uh, some of us maybe have heard of that name, Thomas, Thomas Square. Um, sends his Admiral of the Pacific Command um, immediately to Kawi Keoli and in a ceremony attended by thousands of people in a place called Kula Okahua um, in Honolulu at the time. Uh, it was sort of a very uh, rural area. Um, the ceremony between uh, the Admiral and Kawi Keoli Kamehameha Ekolu took place um, and the Hawaiian uh, the Union Jack, which flew over Hawaii for five months, was lowered. It was replaced by uh, Hai Hawaii. Um, and this became sort of the nexus of the famous saying, Ua mau keo o ka'aina i kapono, which we all sort of know. Um, now, this is important because many of us know this phrase. It's been in a lot of our mele. Um, it appears on some of the appropriated um, assemblages of the fake state. Um, but to understand its political and its historical context, um, ea, um, the sovereignty, the right to rule our life, our breath, um, was returned uh, by Admiral Richard Thomas in this ceremony, and that ceremony, and that day became um, a national holiday, the first national holiday in Hawaii called Kala Ho'i Ho'i Ea, the day that sovereignty, our independence, our life, our breath, our right to rule uh, was returned uh, to where it rightfully belongs. Um, and for 50 years, Hawaii celebrated this throughout the entire Pai'aina. Um, and this was a very uh, uh, well-known and well-participated um, event for the Hawaiian Kingdom um, until 1893, um, when the United States military landed 117 Naval Marine officers. Uh, subsequently, uh, Klansmen by the name of John Morgan uh, established the Organic Acts, in which case um, you start to see how racism in Hawaii, which had already been prevalent with the introduction of missionaries and trade and all that kind of stuff like that, how it really started to uh, materialize itself in its imperial form. Um, and John Morgan, amongst other uh, white racists from the United States of America, as well as the Hawaiian Kingdom, um, began to manipulate the laws, the policies, um, exterminating language, exterminating uh, national holidays, including Hala Ho'i Ho'i Ea, Hawaiian Sovereignty Restoration Day. Um, let's fast forward uh, real briefly, if you will, um, to 1985 and a man by the name of Dr. Kikuni Blaisdell, um, who many of us may know and remember fondly, um, his uh, reputation um, is legendary, I was going to say that. Um, but in 1985, um, Dr. Kikuni Blaisdell learned about this history through this Hawaiian Renaissance movement through a lot of the, the veterans who were coming home, like Uncle Imai Kalani Kalahele, Uncle Skippy. Um, Papa Soli Niheo started to really radicalize their thinking because of their experiences with black lives in the military. Um, 
you know, being sent into war to kill for an empire who doesn't give two shits about you. Um, they started to make these really poignant and important connections. And so they would return home to a country and a place that still devalued um, their sacrifice. I think the radicalism sort of sprung up again. And so right in those 80s, Dr. Blaisdell, with this small group of um, kind of a Maoli, uh, began to reassert, reestablish, restore um, this national Hawaiian holiday um, as small communities. Um, I wouldn't come across it very later on in life when I was 20 and eventually um, working with Dr. Kikuni um, and having been mentored by several of those um, uh, those kupuna, um, I was able to sort of uh, be handed over um, kuleana for the organization of Kalaho Iho Ea. And I'm almost about 15 years into it as well. Um, and I'm looking to hand the ball off later on too, you know, to the next set of generations. So for any of you guys who are watching and paying attention, um, Kuleana is real and it's sticky um, and it's important and it's necessary for our liberation and our freedom. Um, and that's how we're going to get the proverbial uh, knee from the back of our neck so that we can breathe life air again. I'll leave it at that. Mahalo, I love how you're connecting, you know, this concept of air, this practice of air in our culture to the call that Black Lives Matter is making around um, assuring that people are able to breathe, right? Assuring that people are able to live and, and exist. Joy, could you share a little bit about your, um, you know, how your path, your kuleana has interwoven into that uh, history, that mo'oku how that that you might share your involvement with movements and, and how you came to La Hoi Hoi Ea. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I started out actually as an activist uh, in the early 90s, and it really began with um, there was a police officer who had killed uh, a, a man named Aaron Williamson. Um, and actually, I can go before that. Rodney King, I actually was in the Bay Area, I just finished college, Rodney King happens. We believe that because it's on tape, it's going to, the police will finally get, you know, some jail time and they're acquitted. And we, we see this series of riots and, and the entire, and all of California is basically on, under martial law. Like we're under curfew, no one can go out. And I'm in my young twenties. And so literally fighting against police brutality is how I came into the movement. Mm -hmm. And so when, uh, and right after that, um, I was, uh, as a young organizer, a, a man named Aaron Williams was killed in, in what's called sudden in custody death syndrome by the San Francisco Police Department. Um, he was handcuffed and pepper sprayed and not given any water or relief. And he basically stopped breathing. Like, uh, in the same uh, era of we, I can't breathe, he was asphyxiated to death uh, in police custody. And uh, through organizing efforts, uh, very serious organizing efforts at the time, we were able to get um, primarily, uh, Van Jones was there at the time uh, and was a lawyer at the time, was able to get um, his murderer uh, fired from the San Francisco Police Department for the first time ever. So basically my work has been around looking at police brutality uh, and cop watch and understanding the role that the police plays in not providing safety for our lives. Uh, and then I moved into uh, basically prison abolition work with critical resistance, uh, which is a, a feminist abolition, black feminist centered abolition practice to end the prison industrial complex. And, I, and when I came back to Hawaii, uh, I became, I started out as a carpenter because I was so, literally I was burned, I was just burned out and I was exhausted. And, um, but in that time, I, in watching us build things we weren't supposed to be building in spaces we shouldn't be building on Maui, um, on our ancestral land, I was like, this is not for me. I, I, and I saw a young Hawaiian man get killed on a site. And I was like, okay, I hear you. My ancestors, I was like, I need to go 
And right after that, I started working for a program called Being Empowered and Safe Together, which is a prisoner reintegration program on Maui that was run out of um, the Maui Economic Opportunity um, Organization. And that work was to support those folks who had been in prison for five years or more. So what would be deemed as serious offenders, uh, folks who had committed murder, uh, who had gone in for you know burglary, all kinds of large scale crimes, rape, all kinds of stuff, uh, to help them transition back into the community and to their families. And that work was probably some of the most transformative work of my life because I was looking at almost all Hawaiians and the work had to be grounded in Hawaii. We would take uh, those who are on work release, we help them get their IDs back, we help them get their housing back, we help them restore um, family reunification, uh, you know, see their children again. Uh, we all, but one of the key aspects of that work was taking them back to the aina and working in lo'i and working, um, uh, going to archeological sites and going to, um to work with hawaiian practitioners some went back to hula and really helped restore them fully back uh not just bringing them back and they can function within americans you know you know into society that they hadn't seen for 20 years maybe but to really begin to um come back to what it meant to be uh of Hawaii, right? Because many of them had been sent to Saguaro, which is a privatized prison in California, I mean, in Arizona, mm -hmm. uh, and dealt with the violence of that space. Many had come from also from the Shoe in Oklahoma uh, and had dealt with the violence of that space. So it was a, it was a lot of coming back to themselves. Uh, I had met my own family coming out, members that I had not seen for most of my, most of my life, uh, cousins that I didn't even know that were in jail, I got to so, support coming out. Um, and it, and it really gave clarity to who is being imprisoned in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, and, and still within that, the disproportionate amount of black folks that were in conjunction to that. But when it came to the moment of 2013 and hashtag Black Lives Matter happens, Hawaii in a way was not prepared for it. It, it was like, there was so much resistance to it at the time. I remember this like vividly but people were beginning to open up and open up. And by, I believe it was 2016 when we did Nahua Ea, I think. Yeah, um, which is like sort of the cool cultural component just before La Hoi Hoi Ea. Uh, we, um, Pulama Long introduced this idea of Black Lives Matter in the Hawaiian Kingdom. She, she brings that hashtag. And it just so happened that Princess Hemphill, who was the, the um, Black Lives Matter Healing Justice Director who lived in Hawaii at the time couldn't wasn't on island, and I and I was just sort of asked to step in to speak about this, and something that had been almost waiting inside of me sort of exploded out um, to make the intersection of to to bring all my ancestors forward so to speak, and. Um, make the connection between why Black Lives Matter for Hawaiians, because as a Black Kanaka, I didn't know how to, there was no way to separate that. But more than that, we have a very long history of our of Hawaiian bodies being made Black by the United States. And I want us to remember that in that time period from, the, from Kalakaua into to the overthrow, there is this move you know, by the United States to characterize Hawaiians as Pikininis. Like there's this constant barrage of making the queen um, an Aunt Jemima type of character to make fun of Kalakaua, to also bring in uh, to that famous picture of McKinley and looking at Guam and uh, Cuba and um, the Philippines and Hawaii as these Pikinini children. So let's not pretend that we're not deemed as black people to the state at that time and what's also really important to remember is that liho liho in the 1850s in the or the yeah um earlier 1850s 
sees this as he's trying to come back from England from going to school with the monarchs, right? Coming across the United States as a sort of novel, I'm gonna take the train across the United States, seeing that his body and his, and his brother's body is treated as almost thrown off the train. Like they're literally almost thrown off the train uh, because they thought they were black people trying to be uppity in the wrong car. Uh, and that so impacted Liho Liho at the time that he vowed that not only would the United States never annex his country, that he would, that when he came back, you know, 1852, like they released, they, they say, um, they abolished slavery, right? Um, because they saw the, the, the writings, of, you know, the, the writing on the wall, so to speak, of what, how the U.S. saw brown and black bodies. And I think it's, um, what's really amazing about that is, the kingdom was taken over by sugar planters and it's those same sugar planters that came from the American South, the sugar barons, freckles from California, these sugar barons that had set, set this, you know, who were used to using brown bodies as slaves, that were used to using um, uh, black bodies for their labor and couldn't do that somehow in the Hawaiian King because we intervened. And then, so they had to, to bob and weave and try to make other moves to do that. So I think that it's very clear that the connections between the Hawaiian kingdom and their clarity around um, blackness and seeing the way that, you know, that the criminalization of, of, of Hawaiian bodies, which really came into practice at the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century became vivid. So all of that, is the things that was coming for me uh, when I spoke at um, La Hoi Hoi Ea uh, in 2017, I believe. Um, so, or is it, 2000, I can't remember, 2016, 2000, uh, yeah, 2016. And also I, and it was the anniversary of, it was, it was, a, it was the one year that we were celebrating Hanani Ke, and I thought that was just amazing because I really believed that Hanani Ke would have been all about Black Lives Matter. Um, I can't know this for sure, but honestly, taking over freeways, shutting down the state, saying that enough is enough, that's entirely what sovereignty is, are, you know, that's what the sovereignty movement to me was built on, was making these amazing intersectional connections. And so that's what um, really, that I weave into the movement today is helping us remember that at the end of the day, we don't want the U.S. here. <laughs> that we are, uh, we are seeking our we're, the return of uh, the return of our sovereignty, uh, and we know that that can only come with the removal of the occupation of by the United States, which means we're going to need to also remove their their military arms, their their police arms that hold us that want to consistently contain Hawaiian and Black bodies. Um, so I, I'll, I'll kind of leave it there. I hope that <laughs> answered your question. That was a yeah, big Yeah, uh, no, I could, I could listen to both of you talk forever, uh, honestly. Imai, did you want to respond to any of that? Any of the history that Joy's bringing or those connections? Yeah, mahalo for that, Joy. Um, you used a lot of good examples. Um, one example that pops into my head that I kind of like to talk about too with my students um, is the example of racism and Kuhio Kalaniana Ole, the first Hawaiian mixed martial arts international surfing champion, um, which many people don't know. Um, Kuhio Kalaniana Ole, I learned this through Kuka Kalao, was one of the last trained Lua fighters. And in his experience touring the world, especially in Amelika, he came across several, um, well, what's more cultural, what's a more American culture than a little bit of racism, right? Um, and in these small episodes where people were basically calling him, you know, mm -hmm. um, they also didn't know at the same time that he was a trilled, uh, a trained martial artist and he put a lot of guys down. Um, and really, like, it, you could really see how much of an impact that it, that it had, I think, on our Lee and the way that they would design um, sort of the kingdom itself. Um, this morning, I was trying to exercise, you know, and I tried to listen to some revolutionary speakers. So I was listening to uh, Huey Newton. <clears throat> and he talks about something I thought was really relevant to what you're saying at the end in terms of defunding the police, you know, like, um, you know, Huey is sort of, well, back in 68, in the, the interview I was listening to, you know, he was sort of stuck in this conundrum between, you know, self-defense. 
um, because he, for one, took a position against violence, against force, even though he kind of got into his scuffles and he was whatever. Um, he was against wars. He was against imperialism, right? And essentially, he talked about the gun, you know, um, that the gun is really what will never allow peace to happen. Um, force is not the path to peace, you know. Uh, and that's why I think for a long time, the Black Panther Party um, really embraced the idea of defending yourselves until, you know, until those with the force, those who are preserving their imperial privilege, um, need to, you know, stand down and put their weapons away. And that's got to be the case across the world. You know, if America defunds its military, if it defunds its uh uh, it's incarceral system, you know, which is the largest military and incarceral system in the entire world, you know, like um, it needs to be done first. You know, you cannot point your gun at other people and tell them to drop their weapons first. Um, so I think that's one point that, that, that I kind of picked up in terms of just this whole, you know, like 60 years later, we're still having these important discussions about police violence, about systemic racism. Um, and, and it's sort of like verbatim what they're saying in the, in the late 60s is totally applicable and intersectional to what's happening right now. So. Um, just in terms of the idea of, you know, just defunding violence. Um, wh like, what does that system look like, you know, without such a huge uh, investment in force? Military has got the biggest budget. You know, if you probably look at the state, you know, look at the police budget, it's, I'm sure it's bigger than, a, you know, as big as not bigger than um, maybe education, um, which is a reflection, perhaps, maybe of where we put, um, you know, our, our money to, especially when you're talking about investment in programs, social programs that are, that are really going to be beneficial. Um, programs like Kalaho Ihoi Ea, which, you know, produce education initiatives uh, throughout the entire month um, that sort of allow platforms uh, for, you know, really addressing our, our trauma, um, the colonial trauma, the, the generational trauma, um, the violent traumas that we all sort of have to face and sort of heal from. I think that's where I see a lot of the intersectionality between our movements um, and why, you know, I think it's important for us to Kanaka to really um, take a critical pause. Um, a, a friend of mine had said once, uh, Ili Malong, very uh, Akamai, a sharp academic, you know, it's important for us to have a critical pause and really reflect on what um, our position is, you know, what our, you know, like, uh, and how we can be each other's, uh, how we can pick each other up and how we can lift each other up. And I think to me that that's the most um, important uh, part of the strategy moving forward for Hawaiian people and liberation is to make allies, is to make alliance. Um, and we need to do that um, as an important function of our own growth and our own healing as well too. I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Just a couple of other things I wanted to interject into what you're saying, because um, as you're talking about that self-defense and when you're listening to Huey Newton, and as you were talking about that, it made me think about that quote from George Helm, right? We are against war, so against warfare, but more so against imperialism. Um, and the, uh, not George Helm, but the activists um, of his time in Hawaii also visited the Black Panthers, right? So Auntie Moni Keala Akaka and Uncle Kalani Ohelo. Um, and they, you know, were looking at what are, what are uh, these Black organizers uh, who are really engaging in self-defense of their communities? What are they doing? And not to copy them, but to learn. What are the lessons that can be learned from them? Um, and then I just wanted to kind of follow on what you were saying about healing, because uh, I'm hoping that you can talk a little bit to, you know, both of you about um, how La Ho'i Ho'i Ea and the celebrations that we have in La Ho'i Ho'i Ea both address these critical problems, but also include very robust practices of, of healing our La Ho'i. Um, so yeah, do either of you want to say a little a bit about that? And you know, both of you are artists too. So um, I think that's such an important part of our healing practice too, right? And that that also gets included in the Laho Ihoi uh, um, month long celebrations. So 
yeah, how are the events that you've been involved with, with the contemporary celebration of La Ho'i Ho'i Ea, um, giving us some of that critical pause and also space for healing? Well, I would say that uh, given the way that, um, that Imai especially has been able to set up La Ho'i Ho'i Ea, where we introduce new ideas or new movements and new, new critical debates in this space is incredibly important. Um, we, we weren't really having a broader discussion about why Black Lives Matter. We weren't really having a discussion about other things in regular talk. But in this space, which is a specific political space, you're allowed to engage in a new debate and bring it up, right? And you're allowed to suddenly float an idea that maybe people were like, well, I don't have to talk about that because nobody's really talking about it. Well, now we're talking about it. And now, and now we're in a space where you have to talk about it. Um, and if you would have told me five years ago that we'd be saying defund the police today, I would have laughed at you, but it's amazing. Uh, and it's because we are now better equipped to float ideas and have people listen to it. Uh, and we have these critical spaces. Mauna Kea was, became incredibly important at La Hoi Hoi Ea, right? Like these, this, it became, um, and when you look at the role of art and art exists in every movement. There's no liberation movement without art. It is vital, it is central to the hegemony of the movement. Uh, and when I say the hegemony of the movement, there's a lot of big, people love to talk about the big ideas, but what hits them at home is the poster they put up in their house from the movement, is the flyer they kept, is the postcard they took away, is the, the screen print they walked away with. They're, they, it's that everyday piece, the common sense piece, the, the storytelling piece. Oh, did you know that, um, that you, know, Noi, you know, Noi gave me this t-shirt and it means so much to me, like things like that. The intimacy of art um, and, the, and, the, and the global nature of art is what is so amazing about it in a movement. And so that's why it's so vital. And, but at the same time is always sort of kept as the side kind of, oh, that's cute. You make art. No, art is at the middle. Art is at the center. You don't have it without it. Um, if you don't have dance, you know, if like you don't have, like they say, if you don't have song and dance in my revolution, I'm not coming, right? So we need those things, but we also need those critical spaces. And the great thing about La Hoi Hoi Ea is that it, it brings all of that together. It is art. It is critical discussion, it is song, and it is liberation, and it is bringing that all together. And we throw down, and we have the discussion, and we have it out. And that's how we're supposed to do it. It's a principled space to do these things. It's way better than Facebook, because I get to look at you face to face and say how I feel about something, right? I can agree, and I can nod, and I can feel, and then I can go get a massage after. You know what I mean? I can go get some lomi after, right? Uh, we can eat together, right? And then we build this space together. And that is the beauty of that. Um, and I think that we need more of these kinds of spaces, not just on, the, on our national holidays, but all the time, because that's where we really grow. Um, because, and COVID has really kind of knocked a lot of the discussion out in a, in a way, because we haven't been able to come together and cry and mourn and, and think about the losses that are going on. And that's what made that 10,000 people march so uh, nuts because we were willing to do that in the middle of a pandemic, you know, because that's how important this moment is. Yes. That, that this historic moment, like right now people are like, what side of history are you gonna stand on, mm -hmm. right? And for a lot of people, they're really falling on the wrong side of history, right? So I need to be able to say, you know, people when people say, where were you in 2020? when this happened. And then I, I wanna be able to say, I was actually on a stage talking about this, right? I was actually able to bring my voice to this, right? Um, and the power of oration, which we don't talk about enough, I think is really important. That's, what, that's also what La Hoi does, is that it allows the power of oration of speech to be valued as it was always valued in the kingdom, you know? Um, but I'll leave it there, I'll pass it off to you, Mike. <laughs> You're muted. In the mute. Uh, Mahalo for that joy. There's so much stuff that uh, you're just popping in my head, you know. Um, but, you know, uh, decolonization and the study thereof has really um, underscored the, potent, uh, the, the importance of humanity. 
um, and the recovery of our own humanity um, to really take control and determine our own future aspirations, you know. And so um, Kalaho Ihoi for me is this sort of a vehicle to reclaim, you know, uh, to restore, to revive, to resuscitate, not just our or our air, our sovereignty, um, but it's to it's to share our breath, you know, like us Kanaka do with one another. You know, it's it, it's to it's to intervene, you know, in this over century long um, suppression of our people. You know, it, it's about creating a safe place for independence, but it's about being adaptive and reflexive. To the community and our needs as they come and and so as we started to build what was once more or less a gathering of you know Hanaka Maoli um, talking about the historical significance of what this means um, our job our generation um, has tried to modernize and advance and to progress um, and to update you know um, the modern Hawaiian movement and to give us a platform on La Ho'i Ho'i, whatever, what else perfect day than the restoration of our sovereignty, the restoration of our life and breath and our ability to rule, to begin having the critical conversations, the critical dialogues, those intersections always happening uh, between health, uh, between politics, between education, um, between um, grassroots efforts um, that give uh, amplification to what's going on in Waimanalo. You know, congratulations to the Huna Niho Warriors. Um, what's going on in Kahuku? What's going on, up in, you know, on the Mana? What's going on in the Philippines? You know, it's never been just about a local, um, uh, a local issue. It's always been about how we can use um, our combined voices, our combined efforts to raise us all up together. And it's one thing that I learned about Black Consciousness Movement. You know, is we're all gonna go home together. Um, and so our role specifically, our kuleana, you know, the many uh, things that we we do um, to ho'o Hawaii, to ho'o Kanaka, to ho'o Lahui, um, in all of our communities, you know, for me, Kalaho Ihoi, I'm very blessed to have been able to uh, to carry something that has already been created, has already been started by people who have the esteem, who have the respect, and now our job was to not repeat it or replicate it our job was to revolutionize it uh you know you know revolutionize the revolution um and because of that we have spent years trying to reach out to different communities try to establish different programs try to uh to just make ties with kanaka who are already doing the good work um that contributes to the uh the air of our land the air of our people the air of our future um from Pai Pai Oeheia down to Kahana. Um, we have carving workshops, you know, we have uh, people who are doing educational um, conferences, you know, we have, uh, like you saw, Ahamele Ea has been like a four, four year long attempt to really take our message uh, and the education of um, Kalaho Iho Ea into communities that wouldn't otherwise necessarily show up on a Sunday um, at Thomas Square. So. Um, inspired by what the Black Panthers did, inspired by what George Helm guys did, is like we took our message to the communities. Um, and that's how La Ho'i Ho'i spreads. Um, and now we're starting to see, um, I think, the momentum build up in different islands. The momentum start to spread all the way out to New York, you know, like people are remembering these days. Um, and I think taking pride and taking a sense of healing and reconnection I think putting all of those things into context, what's going on in the Mauna, what's going on in America right now, as it burns down to the ground, we're starting to see in the flame of it all, the, the, the cockroaches for what they are, you know. Uh, we're starting to see where the pukas are at, and we're starting to understand more clearly the condition that we have been uh, put into. And likewise, I, I think the remedy for us is to, is to unite, is to rise up, right, yeah. Um, is to leave and uh, live and breathe again for our Lahui. Um, and, and I think in July, we've really, really tried hard in our different community capacities to bring more focus back to our own independence. Um, and there's a famous saying, well, not a famous saying, but there's a good saying that I liked around Halal Kuman is, you know, we're everything we need. You know, we are who we need. Um, we don't need to wait no, for nobody else to, to give us the things that we need. We build it ourselves. Um, so, huli kalima ilalo, like uh, Anakala Erika Anana said, 
uh, we're not a generation trying to wait uh, for integration. We're not trying to wait for our civil rights. Um, nah, uh, we're going offense instead. Um, we're going to play some special teams, um, and we're going to try to get there before the fourth quarter is over, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, sorry for all of you uh, football guys out there. I know it's been a while. <laughs> I want to um, draw on a couple of these themes that you've raised about, you know, we both, we are who we need and we have to all go home together. Um, and Joy mentioned the power of oratory and how La Ho'i Ho'i Ea has created this space for some of our great orators, like the two of you, to shine. Um, and I wish that I had the speech that Joy gave at La Ho'i Ho'i Ea, um, in 2016 at Nahua and then at the main event. Um, but I do have a very short excerpt from something that she wrote at that time. And then I'm gonna play you a little bit of uh, her, her speech, but I think it's amazing to kind of juxtapose these words. The first one really seems to me prophetic in so many ways. So um, this is right after the killings of Michael Brown. Um, she writes, Joy writes, I will never stop believing in sovereignty and liberation. I am a descendant of the slave trade, the trail of tears, and the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom. I am the child of resilient ancestors who faced atrocities I can only imagine. It is because they stand with me that I refuse to be afraid. But that does not mean I did not cry. I cried in front of my ancestors until I was shaking. That was the first thing I needed to do because each drop of salt water returned to the earth stiffened my resolve and the path became clear. We are all targets for aggression right now, but the consistently unchecked violence that has been unleashed on African Americans will most likely increase. We need each other more than ever. To deny this only gives consent to more violence. Black Lives Matter in the Hawaiian Kingdom. So with that, I'm just going to go ahead and give you a little taste of Joy's uh, speech at the Hawaii for Black Lives March, where over 10,000 people marched uh, in June. Oh, Joy, such, such an amazing uh, speech. And one of the things that I love about both of you when you give your speeches is that it's not just your voice, but that you always try to bring other people's voices to that space and give people the opportunity to you know, vocalize our rage, our hope, our connection to one another. Um, and that expansiveness that you both have. And 
so you both kind of touched there uh, on how we're connected. You know, I am not free until you. we are all free as you were having us chant joy. Do you want to expand on that and that idea too of Black Lives Matter in the Hawaiian Kingdom, but also Black Lives Matter in Oceania? Uh, sure. I, no one knows this, but I, I, that was a completely in the moment speech. So I don't, I, it was not a planned speech. I just have, I'll usually just give myself, here's a touch point that I want to make sure I cover. And then I let the crowd kind of give me the energy to speak, so to speak. Um, I knew that, well, first of all, that, that march was organized by high school students. And I think people really need to hear that, that that was organized by 16 and 17 year olds who just had a sincere desire to come together to talk about injustice and, 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 the, and the violence of the police state. And the amount of energy that was going into preventing that march was actually what got me involved. Um, because this period is incredibly traumatic for all of us, as you can imagine. Um, and the idea of, of adults trying to in any way interfere with this sincere desire for youth to speak and raise their voices to this moment really infuriated me, if I'm honest. So I was like, okay, well, how can I support these youth? And how can I bring the organizing experience that I have to hold up their voices to make sure that they speak first, that they're at the center of this? And I really was trying not to speak that day, um, primarily because it was for it was a, a young woman, black young woman, led uh, at the center march. At the same time, this was a platform that I could anticipate there were going to be more than just a couple of thousand people there, which is what was the initial idea. Oh, maybe just a couple thousand. That was the, the day that was called internationally to march by Movement for Black Lives. So we knew it was going to be more than a couple thousand, it, but I could not have anticipated 10,000 or the 15,000. Um, and we, we also could not have anticipated the number of, of cops in Aloha shirts, the, you know, the, the other cops the um in regular clothing the helicopters the cops on the on the rooftops and so all of that i mean we were literally contained um and not we were marching and it was a youth led march and so the need for that much containment was kind of amazing to see right the panic around the idea of black bodies marching or marching for black lives it didn't even have to be black lives just to march for black lives that was an incredible amount of energy to just bring into the day um, in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, and of course, when the, the march went off without a hitch, without any real problems, then it was like, oh no, well, you were doing that without in the middle of COVID. I mean, there's just so many things around this march that, that uh, are, are interesting to me. But it was that much energy, the, the willingness to speak during a pandemic is incredibly important to note. And so it was like, when, when are we gonna have this platform uh, again, uh, quite like this? And it really spoke, that March in particular, really spoke to the amount of work that we have all done since the first time Black Lives Matter came up in 2013, the amount of work to do create intersectional connections, the amount of education in classrooms, the amount of discussions uh, in movement building, the amount of discussion on the Mauna to connect our sovereignty, Standing Rock, the role that Black Lives Matter at Standing Rock and that connection really all built to that day, to that moment. And it was clear that in that moment, we, many of the po folks there realized that enough is enough collectively, that this isn't just about my movement. This isn't just about, you know, climate justice. This isn't just about um, Hawaiian sovereignty. When I saw signs that said Kia'i for Mauna uh, Kia'i for Black Lives, that's when I knew we turned a corner. And so all of that was informing um, my ability to get up and say, 
you know, it's almost like a rock concert too. It was like a very like, I felt like, you know, Freddie Mercury and Queen, like, ew, you know what I mean? Like you're just out there and you've got this chance to do a call and response. How can you not do that? You have to do that. But being able to speak to a crowd like that, um, you know, I've spent a lot of time studying speech. I've studied the way that Hona Nikkei spoke and she studied Fred Hampton. She studied Malcolm X. She studied other people. It, you don't just get up and speak. You get mm -hmm. up and speak because you understand the role. And Audre Lorde, you know, said, you know, if, you, if we, um, you can be afraid and speak anyway, like, because my silence is not going to save me, right? You know? Because yeah. they're, they're going to try to come for me whether I speak or not. So it's better to speak, right? And um, so all of that and all of my ancestors were there to be able to say and to look out and honestly mean for, for maybe the first time for real, look out and say Black Lives Matter in the Hawaiian Kingdom and really see it in the faces of people there. Now there's complications. There's many black folks here representing the military and, and, and they're representing the state of, you know, and they're representing, uh, they're holding the gun of an occupied Hawaii. There needs to be that discussion, right? Um, but in that moment, because the, the center was those youth we needed to just be able to hold them up high and celebrate that uh, and celebrate this moment. Um, but also it's important for people to realize that there is a black Pacific, that black birding occurred, uh, that when I say the black Pacific, which is not our term, right? It's invented by um, Europeans about Melanesia, Micronesia, Polynesia, these, these fake uh, categories, these fake distinctions between us, putting us in proximity to whiteness or, or blackness, that there's a genocide happening in West Papua. Those are bodies that are black. That they're uh, that having discussion. That people are having discussions about why Black Lives Matter in Fiji, in Vanuatu, in the Solomon Islands, and even they're saying, even having debates about, well, that's an American issue. But they're like, what are you talking about? Um, of course, we're black bodies that ma that lives matter. Um, Australia's having these discussion among Aboriginal folks and pushing against the Australian government. So everyone is speaking against their occupier in this moment. Mm -hmm. And so when I talk about the, you know, why Black Lives Matter in Oceania, uh, and this is, um, this is also happening in Samoa and, and the Marshalls, and you know, we had a beautiful group, like folks from Micronesia and the Marshall Islands holding up signs and, and sharing that to say they stand with Black Lives. Now, this, this is major, these are major moves, you know, um, that folks are realizing we share the same oppressor and we have always shared the same oppressor and they've been trying to keep us divided in this proximity to whiteness this whole time. And so that's why it's important to be like, you know, West Papua, I see you, Hawaii sees you because we're asking people to see Hawaii and our sovereignty desires. How do we expect people to, to celebrate our liberation if we do not celebrate see and recognize their need for liberation, mm -hmm. right? Especially in Melanesia and the way that we in Hawaii tend to always leave Melanesia out of the discussion, right? And so we need to, it was an opportunity to kind of be like, oh yeah, there's this other part of the Pacific that we're, we're not talking about. There's also a history of blackbirding and a lot of people don't know that history of the sugar planters coming to Fiji, coming to Australia, literally with Confederate ships, and then going to Queensland and Australia and stealing black bodies to work on their sugar plantations. These are the same people, folks. Mm -hmm. So let's start pretending that the South and the plantations are something in America, right? They are in the Pacific. They are run by the same people. The same kind of uh, criminalization of our bodies came from those ideas. Same racial theories came from these folks. Why are we drinking the Kool-Aid? of someone else's ideas about us. This was not how we were. And uh, so that's why it's so important in these speeches to call things out and name them and, and name those connections. Uh, and, be, and, it's, and it was incredibly brave for those young people to call that march when no adult did. You know? So they were very brave. And I needed to honor that braveness by also being brave enough to say defund the police. I need to be brave enough to say cancel RIMPAC, which we can talk about a little bit later, but to say like, these are the apparatuses in, our, in this country, in our country that are being, that America's holding up and saying, this is what you've got. This is, 
you know, you need to hold this up. Why do I need to hold up these apparatuses? They were never ours. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and they're only there to protect capital, right? We know that the police that were sent to the Mauna were there to protect the corporation. They're not there to protect us, they're there to protect the corporation. We know that um, the police, you know, that the military is sent to protect America's capital interests abroad, their extractive colonialism abroad. So when we start getting that kind of clarity, it becomes easier and easier at a march or at a space like that to name what needs to be named. Now, do you feel vulnerable after that? Of course you do. You're like, what did I just say in front of all these people, in front of all these cops? <laughs> we had a wall of cops behind us, mm -hmm. you know? We had a wall of cops in the crowd, but this is the time to speak, right? This is the time to say it because we, we have seen it, we've had, we, it's enough. We've had enough. And so that's why, you know, like when I, I feel like when I speak, I'm not even speaking. It's not even me, right? It's my ancestors saying, look, we didn't go through all this so you could just be on the sideline and like not say anything. And I think that for a lot of folks who uh, value oration the way that, um, that we do, there's no, you don't really, you're not given an option. Like not everybody, everybody has a different role in the movement, but if you have the gift to be able to speak, you don't, you're not given an option not to, as much as you try not to, right? And, um, but that, you know, but that's a tremendous kuleana. It's a tremendous kuleana um, because that means you're also willing to take a hit that other people may not be willing to. And so, um, and I'm, I'm not just speaking for myself, that's for all these young folks that are out there speaking right now, all these folks, that are willing to speak to such incredible violence that they have no choice, that, they're that we're willing to put our lives at risk in a pandemic, right? Um, in the same way that in the kingdom, we were dealing with uh, Hansen's disease and bubonic plague and, and whooping cough and typhoid and tuberculosis and all, any number of, we were always in a pandemic. And um, we are the descendants of those who survived a pandemic many pandemics to be here. So to not speak is doing them a disservice. To not stand for that unity is to do them a disservice. Sorry, that was a big speech all by itself. <laughs> and this is why I love listening to both of you talk. And I wish that we had a whole lot more time. Um, we, we actually are coming short on time. And so I want to... Um, make sure we get in a couple of things before we close, which is um, time to talk about cancel RIMPAC a little bit, which is one of the issues that um, is really relevant here to Hawaii today. It's relevant to um, opposing the expansion and the, you know, and the continuing level of, of empire and militarization, particularly in the moment of a pandemic in Hawaii. Um, and then I, I'm hoping that we can just say a little bit also about what are some of the things that are coming up for um, the month of July in terms of all of the amazing programs that are going to continue these conversations on how um, Black Lives Matter in the Hawaiian Kingdom and um, why we need to see the connections between all, the, all of these different issues. So um, do either of you want to talk a little bit about Cancel RIMPAC? Well, I can't, but I just did a whole speech, so I don't know if you can <laughs> jump in there. I'm happy to. Uh, maybe I'll just say something before Joe goes on. <laughs> um, I really uh, appreciate what, what you know what Joe is saying in terms of um, you know how we uplift and propel um, the community through oration through kuleana. You know, like because kuleana is both a privilege as well as a burden. You know, like I don't know of any like speaker that's like super excited to get up there, but I think at some level you need to accept the fact that you can speak, so you need to get out there and do something, right? Um, and so one of the things that I think also becomes incredibly relevant during the time of La Ho'i Ho'i Ea and trying to build a platform to really amplify the concerns of all of our communities is um, the ongoing um, resistance uh, to the largest uh, naval exercise um, in the world um, right in our back home. Um, and this is something that maybe not necessarily is common knowledge, I think, to a lot of us Kanaka Maoli because we are forced under the oppressive system of uh, crappy jobs at McDonald's and Burger King and stuff like that, you know, to, to really worry about things uh, beyond uh, like um, 
how Uncle Skippy talked about Nero listening to that music. Um, but today, um, one of the largest destructive forces in Hawaii uh, remains the United States military, believe it or not. Um, the biggest polluters is also uh, the biggest uh, industry um, supplying Hawaii. Um, and every year or June, um, at least coming up in uh, 2020, they're expecting about 25,000 military personnel um, from all parts of the world um, that are going to be descending on our small islands um, to exercise the latest and greatest of naval weapons of destruction. Um, training programs, training exercises, and we can sort of see, um, like we had talked about a little bit earlier, just this proliferation is doubling down on force and violence. Um, we see it in the police force, we see it now on a global, uh, on a global level. Um, and we, it really makes us force, force us to sort of look at this huge industrial complex, you know, um, the weapons industrial complex, the, the industry of war, you know. Um, there's a lot of uh, commentary uh, about the American addiction to war. Um, there's a lot of economic, you know, follow the money trail. And it's something I learned from Kyle Kajihiro, you know, like following the military is easy. You just follow the money. Um, and to me, it, the, the, the gathering of international bodies for the continued protection of capital interests in foreign lands, colonialism, imperialism, um, you know, is part of that systemic, um, problem that continues to allow genocides in different countries um, that continues to allow the oppressed to remain uh, in the condition of wretchedness um, it allows um, the proliferation of the powerful to continue to be powerful um, at the lives um, at the blood of you know of colored people uh, around the world you know the disenfranchised end up becoming uh, filling the body bags of the wars for corporate greed. Um, and so in, in this sense, it's very important for us here in Hawaii to start to really educate and begin to have important discussions about not just police brutality, but military, uh, military brutality, you know, um, foreign policy brutality. Um, what comes, you know, like how does this phone get into my hand? Um, is it extractive uh, mineral deposits that are being taken out of places that I've never been to? Um, you know, displacing, removing, um, through force peoples who I have no connection to. And there, there, there's a lot of ethical and moral reasons why I think it's important for us to have these, uh, these critical discussions, especially for some of us who have military and uh, military family as well too, like I do. Um, but RIMPAC um, is, is something that I think needs to kind of continuously uh, be developed in terms of our Lahui discussion, uh, because just as drugs just as you know employment is important today so it will be important in the lahui um so we need to plan and organize and strategize and imagine that future um knowing that we still need to address these problems and one of the major ones and i'll leave it at this is the problem with uh over militarization of our homelands um as well as the world um and sort of like um huey had said earlier um you know if you want the world to come to a closer place of peace i'm you know, summarizing, um, we need to start with putting down the guns, not proliferating them. Um, so we need to cancel RIMPAC immediately. Mahalo, Imai. Joy, you want to add to that? Yeah, um, folks, uh, so for those who don't know, the RIMPAC has been happening every two years since 1972 uh, or 71. And it was actually part. There were. It was actually part of the Koholave struggle. People went out to to um, protest mm -hmm. uh, Rempak. So this is a long struggle within Hawaii. We are the head of the Pacific Command, and even though this year, because of COVID, uh, they said they're going to keep it at sea. We also uh, at sea only. What does that mean when they say at sea only? Well, that means that they will. Uh, maybe they won't have an amphibious assault vehicles on the shore, but that means that they'll maybe launch missiles into the sea. That means that um, Navy sonar might cause the beaching of whales, which it does every single time it's here. It may cause tremendous marine damage that we can't even know that will go on for months and months after. So when we say at sea, you know, the Mona is part of our Aina as well. Mm -hmm. um, it may mean that 
folks from Guam fly over Kwakula and bomb Kwakula and don't stop. That's what that means. So when we talk about these these games, even though this year, like we know that Israel has pulled out because of COVID, we know that Chile has pulled out because of COVID. The 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 need to even have these games at all ever is, uh, and we're forgetting that there's an innovation fair, which really means this is a weapons fair for the military. This is also a moment of trade of different ships. When one ship gets uh, retired in one place, for example, like in Australia, um, it gets sent over to Chile. We know this, this is in their news. This is not secret, right? That these are, these, that there's a, tr this, is, there's, this is completely tied to capitalism. So people can, we cannot keep separating business from the military. The military exists to protect business abroad. And Hawaii is strategically placed to be the he'e, the head of the he'e, for all of these different types of exchanges and being protected by the U.S. military. Uh, and, and when we talk about this, when we talk about the U.S. being involved in this, using Hawaii as a country, that includes Guam, it includes Okinawa, it includes Korea, it includes the Philippines. Uh, and all of those places that the U.S. has put its influence uh, and has occupied militarily. Uh, and so even if there's not exactly 25,000 people coming th this year, um, we know that the military has lifted the quarantine on the, on the military and their families. I don't know why, right? Um, because I'm not sure what's essential for the families to be out and about for. But, And I also want us to also think, I don't know anyone. I don't know a single Hawaiian that doesn't have somebody, doesn't have family in the military. I don't know one. So we need to like think beyond, yes, you know, my uncle, you know, our parents, they're good people. You know, we can acknowledge all of these things. We can also acknowledge that in uniform, they are representing a state of violence um, and that the state is predicated on violence. We also know that from our veterans, they're not concerned with their lives either. The willingness for the Navy to put, when they have some of the highest COVID levels in the military, to put them at, which we saw um, from USS Roosevelt in Guam, their willingness to put their own um, personnel at risk for the sake of military gains says that our values are completely out of whack. We know that, so it's, it's clear that the US is interested in moving capital and protecting capital and pro proliferating war, right? And that is not, so that's why we need to think about investing in Aloha Aina futures. It means we need to invest in education. We need to invest in a true healthcare system for all, right? And when we say defund the military and the police, we mean take that money and put it into things that are life affirming, right? Uh, and the more we put into life affirming things, including libraries and arts, I'm just going to do the shout out for the librarians because I'm a librarian, right? <laughs> we know that at UH, the journal, you know, like a lot of our books have, you know, a lot of our access to our books are being cut off. The education, um, they don't want us to think critically. So, of course, there, there's always an excuse to defund spaces of critical development. And there's always a justification for war. There's always a justification for militarization. So we need to be able to somehow step back and know that in a very personal way, having all of our folks in these spaces makes that, violent, that violence more intimate. And we need to, um, because the pain of having another Hawaiian come to you to arrest you or to, to weaponize Aralelo to arrest you, is the most painful moment. And so we need to be able to have these hard discussions. So when we talk about RIMPAC, we're really thinking about the whole Pai Aina, but also just like, what does it mean for our bodies to be involved in, these, in, in this space of, of continuing war that's being fueled and that is really, quite frankly, not concerned with its veterans, not concerned with its existing personnel, and certainly not concerned with the protection of life. Um, and how do we reinvest um, our time and our money and our budgets, which are moral documents, right? They always say into life affirming, life enhancing, uh, peace driven um, economies. I'll leave it that. And that is, I think, a perfect way to talk about what 
La Hoi Hoi as um, programming is all about. You know, you talked about uh, um, investing our time, our mana, our energy into that which is life affirming. And in so many ways, the programming that is going to be taking place um, throughout the month of July is about affirming uh, life, particularly affirming Kanaka life and Black life. Um, so I'll share a couple of things and I'm going to ask Imai to share more about the programming planning. Um, a couple of the threads of La Hoi Hoi Ea this year that um, I'm involved with is our Nahua Ea thread, which is always focused on music and spoken word. Um, and this year, uh, one of the themes is going to be around um, giving voice to the connections and experiences and stories of um, Black Kanaka, of Black folks in Hawaii, and of Kanaka who are standing for Black lives. Um, as part of Nahua Ea, Hanale Bishop is also leading a huli giveaway so that um, we can support families who want to be growing haloa, growing kalo in our own um, homes, in our own spaces. Um, and then another thread that I'm involved with uh, is the Hoike Ea thread, which is an annual conference of Ea educators, educators for independence. And um, we're going to be offering a series of um, online content primarily, but focused on youth, on parents who are now becoming educators in the COVID moment and on, and on teachers. Um, and the youth component I'm really excited about is going to be um, really a conversation between the high school students that Joy mentioned that organized Hawaii for Black Lives March and Kanaka youth um, who have been involved with organizing around the Mauna and other um, issues around Hawaiian independence and Ea Hawaii. So that's um, just a little a peek of what we're going to be doing. And Imai, can you share what else was going to be going on throughout July? Um, sure. Um, like it's already been mentioned, um, Kala Hoi Hoi Ea is not just a single day. We try to celebrate as a month-long celebration in all our communities with all of our different partners and their voices and their families. Um, so that is not a singular event. It is an infinite event. Um, in addition to um, Nahua Ea, um, as well as Hoike Ea, uh, we've been working uh, to bring forward um, the power of Mo'olelo, um, specifically in film. The last two years, we've been working with a couple of Native Hawaiian film makers, um, specifically Kaliko Mai'i and Aina Paikai, um, who um, were trained on their uh, Merata. Um, and this year we're kind of excited because our uh, initiative is going to be a chance to premiere um, the very um, anticipated film um, called Hawaiian Soul, which is a short film on George Helm. Um, I will shout out to Kolea, um, Hukumitsu, and the Ohana down Johnson Road, um, holding it down. Um, the star for uh, Hawaiian Soul, who played George Helm, was recently arrested, as some of us know, um, on the east side near Hakipu'u um, by the Kualoa Ranch owner, uh, Morgan. Um, but for those of you uh, who are in Honolulu, um, we're trying to organize a big film night, a drive-in uh, with one of our partners in the community who we've been working uh, with for the last few years, uh, Kavai Vai, who is Hawaiian-owned. Um, so part of it is, again, um, lifting up our communities who are already doing the good work. Um, there'll be other films made by Native uh, Kanaka Maoli um, that are going to be premiered as well, too, and shown. Um, so we encourage you guys to kind of pay attention to our Facebook account as the um, dates um, start coming out uh, very shortly. Um, another one that we're excited about is uh, Ahamele Ea. You saw a short clip of some long-haired guy making a whole bunch of noise. Um, but that was sort of our initial um, attempt to bring our voice um, to an audience that wouldn't typically... Uh, well, the night audience, the crowd audience, I guess. Um, however, this year, because of COVID incidences, what we're going to try to do is we're working on curating um, now uh, an album that's going to include um, most of the artists, if not all of the artists who have been contributing to Kalaho Iho Ea. Um, I've always uh, had a big dream about this. And if you guys are big Makaha Sons fan, uh, Makaha Bash 3, yes. Um, we're trying to work towards building something that um, brings some of the life back, especially for um, some of our Aloha Aina who have passed. Um, Ernie Cruz Jr., for example, I'll bring his name up. 
um, Palani Vaughn um, for a long time have been um, celebrated Kanaka Maoli and have supported for uh, uh, has supported Laho Iho Ea for a very long time. Um, and it's a way again for us to um, put together um, and bring to life again, uh, breathe into life um, the people who have gotten us to this point. I mean, to inspire uh, the people who will move us, move us beyond this point. Um, so our Ahamela Ea will be putting out a an album soon. Uh, we also have a couple of other things kind of in the lineup right now. Uh, we work with uh, Lynette Cruz um, out of YNI. Um, Theft of a Nation has been uh, an ongoing project, uh, community sort of play going on at Iolani Palace talking about, um, well, the theft of our nation. Um, that'll be announced uh, later on or very shortly. Um, we're also working with other groups such as Papa Ola Lokahi. Um, the Ohana's over at Kahana, um, over at Makua, um, and some of the people who take care of Pohu Kaina, they're doing individual um, events. Um, some of our Malama Aina events, uh, Papa Ola Lokahi, um, is a special sort of organization for us because it was uh, founded by um, our founder, um, Kekuni Blaisdell, um, and when we talks about putting some programming um, together that's going to highlight Kekuni and a lot of the work that he has done um, at his house, Hale Kaohinani. Um, and those um, infamous Thursday night meetings. Um, we're going to bring some more attention to that, I think, so this year as well, too. So um, throwing a couple of emu challenges here along the month, um, a couple of exciting things over social media, um, and that's going to be how we celebrate um, our Independence Month um, to sort of, again, amplify who we are, to reclaim uh, where we're going. Um, and so Kalaho Ihoi Ea um, is a very exciting time for us in the month of July to celebrate our independence um, and our ever uh, and our quest for independence, uh, our quest for independence and liberation. Uh, mahalo. Mahalo Nui. So, if people want to get more information, they can um, follow La Ho Iho Iea on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the social media platforms, as well as the website, lahoihoiea.org, I believe. Um, so yes, check those out for more information about the July series of events. And I just want to close by um, thanking you both so much. I think, you know, what I want to say is that your kupuna, your, your ancestors, our ancestors dreamed of you and you are both immense. And I'm grateful for the work that you do for our lahui and for the time that you spent with me and the First Friday audience today. Mahalo, Piha. I love you both so much. <laughs> Mahalo. Mahalo. We're going to win, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. So if you'd like to um, hear more from either of these two fabulous Aloha Aina, please come out to some of the Laho Iho Ia events this July. Aloha Aina Kako. Ahuiho.